Welcome everyone to Getting to Know, a series that provides an insight and uh, into the journey and experiences of local individuals involved with foot in, within football. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that I've got Tia Stedman. Tia is a local referee um, and she's also a player at Colney Heath Women and Oakland College. Uh, Tia, how are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good, good. It's uh, good to good to finally finally get you. And obviously, it's been a bit of a bit of a nightmare with both our schedules, uh, mm. trying to find a find a find a time that matches. But um, yeah, br- brilliant. I'm really excited to to hear hear what you've got to say and know a little bit more about your journey. Um, so, no further ado, uh, let's jump back back into well, let's jump into it. Um, so <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna start right from the beginning, like we do with all our guests. So I want you. So my first question for you is what is your first involvement in football that you can remember? Um, my first my first memories of playing football goes back, way back to like year two. So I was about, I think, six or seven. Um, and I saw my best friend at the time, Sasha, she was walking up to school, after school. It was like four o'clock. She was walking up with her twin brother and she had water guns. And I was like, where about you going with those? And she was like, oh, it's our last uh it's our last school football match of the of the season so afterwards we're gonna have a water fight and I remember going home to my dad and I was saying dad I really want to have a water fight with them and he was like oh it looks like you're gonna have to buy some boots or whatever and, and get involved and then literally as we started um the new school year into year three bought myself some boots because I wanted to I wanted to have the water fight at the end of at the end of the last session so I was like yeah I'm definitely getting into football then and then that's how it all started I guess I've never stopped since then so all from a water fight uh, you know it's created this this massive legacy for you yeah I was like I'm not missing out in that. I'm getting involved <laughs> fair, enough. That's absolutely fair enough um so so what school did you go to then um so that lower school was Ardley Hill at the yeah. time, it's Ardley Academy now. It's called. But okay, uh, and whereabouts is that based? Uh, so that is Dunstable. Yeah, yeah, that's Dunstable. Sorry, I, I'm I'm in between Dunstable and Luton, so I just had to. Yeah. Write. No, no, no. That's fine. No, the only reason I asked that is because um, I'm I'm obviously quite interested in how you know the the effects of an area can can shape you growing up. So, you know, on our last episode, we spoke to. Um, Leah Maddox and and you know she she explained how how Luton had a, had an impact on her as a girl and, and Tony explained how living in Caddington had had a had an impact on him as a person as well so just be interesting to get your thoughts really so what was it so you know did, did growing up in Dunstable slash Luton in between that middle bit did that uh, have an impact on you? Um, I would say so because at the time there was not well from what I can remember there was not many like women um or girls uh team you know caught my eye or there wasn't actually many at all so when we were playing with the school I was with boys and then um I played in a Sunday team AFC for I think I started when I was around nine and left around 15 so I was there for a while but that was a boys team there was no girls teams at the time um that were very local so it was like okay I've got to get used to the fact that I'm going to be playing with boys at that time it wasn't obviously too bad as in the development wasn't too different but obviously when you get older when you get into like 12 13 they obviously start to get taller they start to progress you know they start to get stronger yeah. so it was getting into that mindset where it's like when you come up against boys especially being playing for AFC I was the only girl in the league and they my my managers Ray and Gareth who I love to pieces because I think they are you know um some of the people that shaped who I am and how I play today and how I um how I present myself they stuck me centre back so I was always okay. playing defence always yeah. um and I didn't have a problem with that but it was just getting to the understanding that when you come up against them they're gonna be thinking oh she's a girl you know just let's just keep going down her side because mm. she obviously I'm going to be stronger than her and it was getting that mental toughness but also showing no I'm, I'm just as strong as you and I can put up a fight with you you, you know just like a boy mm. it was just all from a young age it was just fighting to to be seen as a player not as a female player and I think yeah. that's definitely shaped and helped mentally and physically how I how I present myself today. Yeah uh, that's that's really interesting it's a great point that you made around you know that the lack of opportunity and we've spoken about this quite a, quite a lot recently around the lack of opportunity for young girls I wanted to go and play football um, so 
you know, you mentioned around um, having to play with the boys uh, and like you said, having to almost like prove a point, if, if that's fair to say. Yeah, definitely. Do you, do you think you took that away from football to, to the other things that you do now? Oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think I think that made me more competitive, definitely. Yeah. In in any situation, if I if I'm you know going into school work and and you'd have to do projects, I would be like, uh, no, I, I can lead just as good as you can. I've proven it before, so you know I'm going to raise my point. It also made me a lot more confident because it was like, if my managers like trusted in me to be you know, in that situation where there was boys on the side and that they could easily have picked, then it yeah. means you're doing something right. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, when yeah. outside of, of football, just like speaking to people, speaking to, because I used to struggle quite a lot with social anxiety and stuff like that, but um, playing with boys and, you know, they mess about and they do jokes and all this and that, just just literally interacting with with people that I might have only met once or twice, it became a lot easier for me because my confidence skyrocketed when I was able to like have the freedom of, of playing with boys, if you understand what I mean. Yeah, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And again, I think that's a, that's a result of, well, from me looking out or from an outside perspective inwards, it, it's an, it's an impact of, you know, firstly, the environment that you're in with, with the boys, but I think secondly, within, you know, the, the coaches that, like you said, they show the belief in you, Mm-hmm. you know because like you said it'd be very easy for the first thing you know if you're ha- if you're having a little bit of a bad game or whatever for them to pick up oh you know she's a girl take her off mm. um speak to me a little bit more about the impact of your coaches then. um they when I first came so I actually first joined with my friend Sasha so it was like I wasn't the only girl um but for whatever reason I think she joined another team or or I can't really remember them but she she ended up leaving so at that point I was very much like okay now I'm like by myself quite lonely um but what they did was they they would understand that um because I've been watching football for ages I've been involved in football for for a long long time even before even before that time um when I when I joined the school team I've been watching sport my dad's a really sporty person so I've been watching it for a long time so um I had the I had the football in brain. I like mm-hmm. knew where to be, what to do, and they kept saying to me, "Use your voice, keep lead, lead that defense because you know what to do." And if they don't listen, keep shouting because you'll make them listen, and we'll we'll make them listen to you because you know you know exactly what you're doing. And also, they um, they pushed me in training. They were like, "Right, you know when you used to split up into teams and you had like uh, it would be like a little nine aside game at the end of the session." Um, or or however many players we had, they'd be like, Tia, you lead that team and you put them in the formation and you put players where you want. And if people, you know, get get the ump um get the ump with you, then you you know, you let them know that this is this is what's gonna work. And that would happen every like every other um every other training session. And towards the start I was very quiet and like I'd be like, Yeah, okay, and I'd do it and whatever. And if people argue, I'd just give them, give them, you know. <laughs> what they wanted yeah as as it got on I started to progress and I was like no they've given they've, they've told me to do this for a reason so actually no this is where you need to go and st- stuff like that so I really think that they did push me a lot because obviously they they knew that I was quite shy and alone and then from leaving the team when I was around 14 15 I was a completely different person so I do it I owe a lot I owe a lot to them I think I think you uh done them justice um, <laughs> uh, so yeah that's a, that's a great point and, and I, I just want to ask a question now because um so I, I, I do a bit of coaching myself mm-hmm. um and you know uh, we're always on like CPDs and talking to coaches and I think sometimes you know coaches we try to second guess people and try to make decisions what mm-hmm. we think would be right which is absolutely fine but I think it'd be really good to hear from yourself obviously being in that environment you know, not long, not long ago. Yeah. You know, so you're talking about, you know, them empowering you and giving you opportunities to lead and be a leader. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and you mentioned that sometimes, you know, like, especially at first, like you expected, didn't quite work out. Mm-hmm. Um, how, in, how important was that perseverance from them to carry on giving you those opportunities to lead, to develop your skills? Mm-hmm. rather than going oh she's done it once it's not quite worked out let me try and fix it now yeah. 
Um, I think it was so important because, you know, you hear that saying, you're your own worst critic or your own harshest critic. Um, so when I would do, when I wouldn't do as well and I'd go home and I'd be like, oh, they're never going to give me that opportunity because I messed it up. And especially when when you're in that situation where you think I've only got one chance, you put all this pressure on yourself that you actually end up not enjoying it. And that means that you're not performing the best because I feel like I perform my best football, my best referee and my best work, whatever, when I'm enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I would go home and be like, yeah, I've, I've messed that up. That's not happening again. And then it would get me down. Yeah. And then when we go to like when you're heading into the next session, you're you're like, yeah, well, I ruined my chance. Somebody else is going to get that now. So them giving me, you know, multiple opportunities for me to prove my self doubt, as in, oh, I'm not good enough. But well, hold on a second here, you are because they keep giving you this opportunity. They clearly see something in you, um, yeah. and that's why you're getting getting given these these opportunities yeah so it's, it's we spoke on our last episode a little bit around a mentor and how an impact of a mentor is someone is sometimes um you know they see more in you than the, that you see potentially in yourself definitely, definitely. Would, you, would you say that they they kind of took that role up with you yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. yeah I think, I think that's a, that's a nice story uh okay right let's uh so, so you obviously played sorry with boys was it till you're 15 is that right? Um, yeah, around that 14, around 15. 14, 15. So talk to me in, in terms of, um, you know, football within your teenage years and what was that like? Um, so within my teenage years, after I left um, AFC Dunstable, I joined a team called Stevenage Borough. Um, and that was an all girls squad, which was good because, you know, it was like, OK, these are without being rude or whatever these are my people do you know what I mean yeah, without, yeah, yeah. I feel like I'm gonna fit in more here because it wasn't even though you're joining a new team it felt easier than than playing with the team that I just left it, it not not in the sense that you know it was they weren't nice or whatever it was just the fact yeah. that I always felt like a little bit of an outsider and obviously coming into to to a team who are like me it was a lot easier to mould um and then also from playing with the boys it was a lot easier to then take up that leadership and it was a, and then within myself I had more drive because I was like I've already done this and I've already done with this with, this with boys so if I can do it with boys I can definitely do it with girls because good you know we work the same we think the same um so joining was actually a lot easier than I thought for myself and then we were quite so we 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 did uh train and we played quite hard we were all competitive because i think we joined around the same same time as as we were all developing at the same time sorry if you get what i mean yeah yeah so uh, we were quite competitive and we and we were dry, driven quite well and we all wanted to achieve more which yeah. was refreshing because joining a girls team I didn't think that they wanted to push as much as I did because I wanted to take this as I want to take this as far as I can in my head and I was just hoping that they could do the same um, and they were so it was a really nice environment and I played with those uh, I played with Stevenage for two years and then coming into college we all went our separate ways kind of but um, the coaches that we had uh, they joined another team, Colney Heath, who I'm playing playing with now. So some of us went over there and some of us done done our own thing. But yeah. you know, those two years were probably, I think, where mo most of my success as of as of today came from. Those, as in, because we were just we went to uh, some of some of the we went to George's St George's Park to do this tournament where we were playing derby and teams like that, and we were just a little grassroots team. Um, so it, it just show it just showed us how much we worked to get to the same position as some of these academies were doing, and yeah, yeah it, it was great. It was really so great. yeah, you talk about a sense of belonging, and I, I think it comes from again uh, talk about like this idea of seeing is believing, uh, mm -hmm. seeing people like yourself, um, and you know, it's like you said, no no discredit to to your previous team, but it's just more so people that you could identify with more. Definitely. Um, so do you, do you think that gave you a stronger sense of like comradeship? 
Yeah, a hundred percent. It was a lot easier for all of us to mold together because I think, I think there was like three or four of the girls that kind of had the same journey as me, whereas they were playing with a boys team before and then and and they come into a, a all girls team. So I think it was easier for us all to mold together and become more of a team quicker. Um, mm. And also, I think that it was almost exciting that we were like okay we're in a girls team and we're actually good do you know what I mean it's, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. When you come from a boys team a girls team you're like oh it's probably going to be a drop, drop in class um but no it was exciting to like the first couple of sessions the first the first month or so it was really exciting because it was like wow we're actually knocking the ball around quite well so yeah, yeah. oh brilliant uh, did you play for the ACC at any point Yes, I did. I can't remember the age group I was, though, because I was quite young. I think I might have been 11, 12, possibly, when I started. Okay, yeah. And then we did, I probably did about four years there, I think, four or five years. Because when I started, yeah, when I started Stevenage, which I think I was 15 when I started Stevenage, that was when I I finished um, ACC. But, yeah, within the ACC, I managed to go to a couple of the... East of England regional camps as well within that so yeah that was, that was a great experience as well um what what was it like then from from playing you know grassroots playing it, it you know with, with your boys team to to going into an environment where obviously there's a bit more of a focus on you know progressing yeah it was it was again refreshing because it was like everybody was walking to uh, working towards the same goal when we were playing with the boys team there was a couple of people that you know were taking it seriously a couple of people that thought they were better than everybody else and then there yeah, was yeah. a couple of people that you know just laugh and joke around with their friends but going yeah. into the ACC where it was like you said focused on developing it was refreshing because everybody wanted to get better okay yeah did you uh, it's just a bit of a personal question I said you know don't feel obliged to answer but no. were there any points where you felt a bit overwhelmed by the whole environment going from especially I'm just thinking about going from a grassroots team to going into an environment where you've been selected to play uh, I remember there was one time where my first East of England camp there was a situation where I don't think I was selected the next year to um to to go for the ACC and then when I was playing with Stevenage or no when I was playing with my boys team so it was it was actually quite it was early I think I was like 13 14 um and I didn't get selected to play for ACC the second year and then I was playing with my boys team and there was a scout there for the East of England and they were like oh uh do some digging whatever and then a couple weeks later I got asked to go down to the East of England regional camp so that was my first camp and I already had some friends from the ACC that obviously made it the second year. Uh, and Macy Hurd, who I'm still friends with now, actually, we keep, we talk about on the train. She was like, oh, yeah, you're coming. Don't worry, we'll be we'll be in a room together um, and all this. So when we get there, like Macy's got her AC, ACC gear on, everybody's got their ACC gear on. And I just come up in just like a, a normal, like a Watford shirt because I'm a Watford fan. So I just right, kind of okay, yeah. And at that point, I was like looking around and I was like, I am literally out of my element here because everybody else is in the ACC everybody else has been selected and I've just come you know in 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 a Watford gear like I was like yeah this is not for me and then at that point I was like this weekend's gonna be tough and and I was yeah. just contemplating like should I just go home because it was really overwhelming but once you once I stuck it out and obviously I had Macy and, and some of my other friends there and then towards the end it, I was like I'm, I'm really glad I stuck it out but at the start it was quite quite difficult yeah and I suppose it, it it can be and this is not just from the guys perspective but the boys perspective as well of mm-hmm. you know if you go from playing like you said playing with playing with your mates and you know necessarily you might not well like you said you didn't start playing because you found football first it's because you know you, you want you wanted to have that the fun side of it of, of yeah. your water fight and everything but yeah. I think it can be overwhelming can't it for especially for for younger players from going you know to to messing about well not messing about but training with your local teams mm-hmm. grassroots teams to going into you know a professional setting with you know full-time staff sometimes and mm-hmm. or everywhere you look there's kit and like you said around this idea of standing out a bit because you're not wearing what everyone else is wearing mm-hmm. um so yeah that, that, that's interesting it's good to have that that insight um let's talk around the around your time at the ACC 
what do you think you took away from it um I definitely took away like you said about the kit and just professionalism the um the importance of getting yourself organized um and the importance of you know your presentation's got to be like on point when you go in everybody's in the same kit make sure that you, you know you don't have any missing kit make sure that you're there on time and that you're there almost every week unless you have a, a genuine excuse obviously with with grassroots it was a bit more a bit more laid back into the point where if you have a session or two sessions a week it wasn't necessarily that bad if you missed one do you understand what mm. I mean but with the ACT it was very much like you have to have an excuse and even if you're injured you have to come so that you can you can watch and you don't miss any development so I think it it changed the way I looked at the game like you said from just almost messing about or being a bit laid, laid back to now in a professional um environment and it yeah definitely it definitely made me feel more professional and it also pushed me to be more organized outside of football like getting my school work done and everything like that all all up to date so that I could go without you know feeling yeah. any pressure or without getting myself um behind and do, do you think then that was that's had a positive impact in in the sense of taking that away because you know we 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 mentioned to the girls around uh, at the ACC at the moment, and I know you know it's pretty much the same any any environment that you go into. It's that you know brilliant that you're here, brilliant that you're here to do this, but actually take away other lessons. So you know, like you said, this is a, I, I haven't thought about that around kit actually. You know, making sure that you've got the right kit on, making sure that the, that you're there, turning up even if you can't participate to take something mm-hmm. away. Did that you know did did was that transferable to like school or college or whatever else you've done? of a hundred percent it 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 set me up well I didn't know at the time but it did set me up for what I was going to see and what was going to happen in college because it's, it's pretty much exactly the same we're at Oakland um where we are trained by the Arsenal under 21s uh women's team and the Arsenal 21s train simultaneously with us on like on a separate pitch or maybe later than us or before us so in that situation like you said it was looking at everybody in kit and understanding that this is a professional environment and also the same thing exactly the same thing when it's you have to show up um and you have to uh even if you're injured you have to show up you have to see the physio and then you have to watch the session stuff like that and also you have to make sure that your school work is on point because if you're not doing anything if you're not doing your college work then the tutors will then communicate that to the coaches and then you can't play. So yeah. it was definitely when I was at the ACC having to, because I, like I like um, like I said, I live in Dunstable and yeah. the ACC was in Bedford. So yeah. it was a half an hour journey there, a half an hour journey back. So an hour round trip. And it was making sure that for that night I had all my schoolwork done so that I didn't go in the next day and get in trouble. That was then transferable to college where I had to get all my college work done because then if I didn't I wouldn't be able to train so yeah. so they did so that definitely did prepare me for what was happening what was going to yeah, happen afterward. definitely and I, and I think it's a credit to yourself because you can only take out what you put in so yeah. and that's obviously a, a great thing that you've taken away from it um let's talk refereeing then how did you get into it um how did I actually get into it I think it was uh, to be honest, I think it was just I was looking for some money. I was looking for an extra job. And then I wanted I was very sporty. I, I started to know at that point. I think I started when I was around 14. Um, I started to know at that point that, OK, I actually want to do like carry on doing sport for, you know, the foreseeable. It wasn't just something that, you know, I was doing it in the moment. Um, and I wanted to earn some money because my mum and dad were very much like, at a young age we're trying to instill these values like the value of money and you know the value of like uh, timekeeping and uh, like we said before with professionalism and things like that so I was um, looking around for some jobs I think I, I didn't do it with the ACC I don't know why I didn't do it because some of my friends did it within the ACC um, but I did it independently um, and I just went up to the Beds FA or I saw on the website that they were having one quite soon so I just went up to the Beds FA and then there as well when I went into the first session um, it was like a night session I think um, and we were just in there just having a look at 
different challenges and different things and saying is that a yellow card is that a red card literally re the very start of the of the course and I was literally again the only girl there but I, it was like that's not too foreign for me because that's happened before so I, I was able to manage it better at, at that time and yeah I completed my course and then did my five um like starter games for, yeah. for my uh, middle school Priory Academy which I went so I did all their school games and that was that helped me because it wasn't like I was just like going to meet total strangers straight away it was like okay these are my PE teachers and stuff like that so I know these people and, and things so that helped like calm the nerves a little bit um, and yeah and then I just after that I just I got my badge and then I started getting allocated games and yeah that was that was how it started. And I know obviously you mentioned that you were looking for a bit of a job and you wanted to stay within football. But what is the motivation to stay refereeing now? Um, now, I really enjoy it. I think that was my motivation. Uh, obviously, the money helps as well. But but at my age, you know, I, I could I could get another job, you know. So it's not really necessarily about the money too much. It's, it's, I just enjoy it. I like to see. Um, I like to watch the youth you know like the the 13 year old boys the 14 year old boys when they're coming in and they're you know and they're having a laugh at their mates but they're also taking it quite seriously and it's like oh I remember you know being where you are so it is quite nostalgic and and I, and I do really enjoy it I, I sometimes I feel like I like refereeing football more than playing sometimes especially yeah, yeah. when you see like it's three three and there's 10 minutes left yeah. and they're both knocking up and down it's like oh this is a really in interesting yeah. game and obviously when you're playing at that point it's probably quite stressful so yeah, yeah. yeah sometimes sometimes I, I enjoy reffing more than more than I enjoy playing and what what in regards to the lessons that you've taken away from refereeing so, you know, obviously you mentioned around how you took away your lessons that you did from the ACC. And then obviously you're still quite fresh into refereeing. But what have you taken away from it so far? Um, I've taken away that it is impossible for you to get everything right in everything that you do. Um, even as much as you try, there are going to be there's going to be a situation where like like if we're talking in referee and sent you, you you don't you generally don't know who it's come off and you look at your liner and he doesn't know you just have to make that that quick judgment call um and when when before refereeing I was quite like no I can do this I can do this right uh, I'm going to get everything right and as I went into refereeing it was like that's unrealistic and it was just going into refereeing and making decisions it was like just being confident because as long as you're confident from my experiences anyway most of the time you don't get too much backlash with it and you know as long as you're if you assert yourself and you explain the decision that you've given then most of the time you'll, you'll be okay yeah 100 and I just want to touch upon the bits that around you know you know for the positives that refereeing gets but it's often not it's often shadowed by, you know, like you said, the backlash and, mm -hmm. and all bits like that. What do you think around the way that some referees are treated in regards to the backlash that they get uh, and, you know, the whole culture, really, yeah. um, towards officials? What, what are your thoughts on that? I think, uh, don't get me wrong, I, I, I think that it, in in certain cases... I understand the heat of the moment element of it because like I say, I, I play football. I still, I still, I still moan at referees, you know, I, I still say, Ref, why did you give that? Why did you give that? But as long as you can understand that that was a heat of the moment, you go, another thing happened and in your head, you're thinking, yeah, T, that probably was a foul. Just get on with it. And as long as at the end you respect the referee, you know, you go cheers ref and stuff like that. So with the heat of the element, aspect of it I do understand but also what I don't understand is why people cannot then you know process it in your head once you have more time to think about it and then you can't like just apologize or just admit that you were wrong and I also yeah. I also think that you have to understand like like I've had to understand with myself like I just said you I can't get everything right 
So I would just appreciate, you know, if if the managers and the spectators on the sideline also, you know, appreciate that I cannot get everything right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, with, with with the backlash that um, that referees do get, like you said, I do think it like takes away the goodness that you know comes from youth football and comes from refereeing and I also think that this is one of the reasons why referees become short and you know and you know um, managers struggle to find officials because obviously how they're treated Um, I think that what the Beds FA, I'm not sure if all the FA's done it, but what the Beds FA done with the uh, yellow armband showing people that uh, you're an under-18s referee, something that I have to wear, I think that that really does help because it, even though, like I said about the heat of the the heat of the moment, subconsciously you're also, when you see that armband, you're also giving them a little bit of slack in that situation as well, um, which I do think has really helped, especially... From what what I've I've been I've been uh, involved in. Yeah, and and just just on that initiative, um, which was yeah, I think there's been a few county FAs that have done it, but uh, Jose's been really good at um, Jose, who's the football uh, p- uh, the workforce development officer. Sorry, mm-hmm. has been really good at uh, developing uh, uh, and promoting that. So the yellow armband that that Jose um, you know has been promoting and pushing for young referees. Um, so like you said, to to and, and I completely agree with you, the fact around that you're not going to get everything right. My argument to that is, well, not argument, but my agreeance to that is players don't get everything right. Mm-hmm. You know, and whilst you might have a little bit of a whinge at them, blah, 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 if they go and score a goal, then, you know, that's all. Or, you know, they stop a goal, then that's forgotten about. Mm-hmm. Coaches don't always get it right. Absolutely do they not get it right. Mm-hmm. You know, um, they make a bad call, you know, they're, they're wound up, et cetera, et cetera. But again, they win you a tough game, then you know they're they're, they're a hero. Yeah. But again, it, it, within this idea of refereeing, it's okay. You understand that you know no one's there to cheer on the referee as such. But in terms of, like you said, accepting decisions and accepting that they're not going to get everything right all the time, I don't think there's there's a reason for like you know we can appreciate that it's the it's the heat at the moment people get you know let their emotions sometimes override them a little bit but like you said at the end of the day once it's finished it's finished and you know upon reflection like you said if you can turn around and say I hold my hands up to that that and that but you know but again the rest of it is that all forgotten about as well yeah so I suppose it's a tough one and like you said in regard to staying involved within football you know if you give someone the option that you know they might have come out of playing or they might come out of coaching and they're like well, they've got a Saturday afternoon free, which is usually be on football. They like to get back in football, but if it means, you know, taking all that abuse and swearing and et cetera, et cetera, is it really worth it? Exactly. So, yeah, so I, I completely agree with you. And I think that there's, you know, there's a lot of work that, that needs to be done uh, and can be done, but not only by, you know, the officials and, uh, and the governing bodies, but I think there's a lot of work that we can that we can do as individuals and as players and as coaches, mm-hmm. um, you know, and as officials to to reduce that that effect of it because you know it, it is I, I would describe it as a disease within the game at the moment. Um, and you know, if if you want to see less and less referees and you want to see more games getting called off due to the shortage of referees, and that's what we're heading for, unfortunately. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so that, yeah, no, that's a great point, um, and I think it's a it's a great initiative that that's been set up uh, um, to to support especially our younger referees. Um, so so within you know so you've obviously you know you've come into refereeing uh, you've been doing it for a few seasons you've done it locally like you said you started with uh, one of your old schools was it that yeah you, yeah so you started with one of your old schools you know got got used to it there um, and progressed and progressed and progressed. Um, so in regards to opportunities to develop as a referee, have you taken any of them? Um, I think, like you said about Jose, I think um, at the moment I've been put on the promotional pathway, um, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, it goes, I'm going from level seven to level six or vice versa. Uh, yeah, um, so you're 76, yeah. 
yeah and and uh obviously that will that will require me to be uh refereeing women's games um so that I can qualify for that um which I'm really excited about because when I started refereeing like I said it was literally just just for a job just you know just to get some money but because I'm actually in, um enjoying it and um like you said about the uh, opportunities for for me to then progress um higher in the in the leagues and higher in the levels um I've actually considered maybe we should you know maybe we should carry on and, and see how far we can get with this because it, it's it, at the end of the day even though I'm, I'm at my college and I'm, I'm looking to go to university and you know study something completely different it is another career option um and especially if I know that I enjoy it already you know I, I I'm definitely open to keep keep progressing and, and see how far that uh, refereeing can take me yeah I and um... I think you put it brilliantly around the work that Jose's done with with this referee development uh, work that he's done, and I think it's just fair that we shine a bit of light on him um, in, in regards to all that all that work that he's done. So, how you know we we spoke around how uh, previously how Mark, who also uh, works for the Bedfordshire FA, has supported the women and girls game, especially um, Tony mentioned it quite a lot around the support that he received. So, what what's the support been like from Jose? Um with Jose if I have any question or any slight slight thing that I'm unsure of whether it's regards to the fixtures that I'm, I have upcoming or regards to a decision that I've made in the game or it's or a possible decision or 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 a, a law of the game he's he's quick to reply to me and he always gives me a, an in-depth answer and explains it to me so that I you know that I I leave it I leave the uh email or or conversation um you know with a calmer a calmer um calmer peace of mind because sometimes yeah. it is quite quite um quite stressful if you've given a decision and then people are arguing you know you're saying that's not this and that's not that so yeah when I always when I email him because I do Saturday and Sundays so sometimes when I email him on a Saturday and I say look I wasn't too sure about this or what would happen if this happened or whatever and I'm kind of crossing my fingers to say hopefully he replies to me for Sunday so that if this situation occurs again on Sunday um I'll I'll be able to uh you know rectify it and and still keep a calm head um and yeah he replies to me within in in minutes in in he, sometimes it takes him like 10 minutes and then he'll reply to me and I'm really grateful with that and um uh, and also I asked him about, because uh, at the time I was going into my second year and I'm thinking about university, so trying to save up a little bit of money for that. Um, I asked him if there was any um, any other jobs, like coaching jobs or stuff that I can do within the ACC, uh, uh, sorry, and, and the Bed Bedfordshire FA. And he replied saying, um, asking me about when my availability is, like, like, uh, showing a real interest and then we actually uh, decided that what would be best for me is to go with the the referee and uh, promotional pathway so I think I was just uh, I'm very grateful to have somebody you know on on the end of an email that I can just ask about anything and, and he'll and he'll uh, help me and he'll give me a decision that that's suited for me. Yeah and I think that's brilliant I think the you know, you spoke about the coaches that you had before and how they supported you within playing and giving mm -hmm. you that ownership. And I, I think, and I hope you agree with me that Jose's been, you know, a good influential figure in regards to that. And 100%. speaking it from from a colleague's perspective, yeah, Jose's got time for everyone, which is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and he's uh, and he's always, you know, in a happy. I don't think I've met a happier man than Jose. Um, <laughs> And one thing that me and Jose do share, which uh, I think you'll appreciate, is that we both get very, very cold. So we're always arguing about uh, keeping the window shut in the office. <laughs> um, but yeah, brilliant. Um, let's talk around. Um, so, you know, you've, you've always had loads of experience. And I, I think it's just remarkable at, at such a young age of done doing so much already and taking so many, not necessarily so much, but the lessons that you've taken away from the things that you've done already. Mm -hmm. Um, so I just want to talk to you a little bit around, um, you know, obviously we've spoken about yourself being, uh, you know, a young girl playing in a boys team and the barriers that came with that. 
Um, and I think it's important that, you know, we've celebrated that, but I think it's also important that, you know, it's and it links very well to the month that we're currently in of Black History mm-hmm. Month. Definitely. Um, so, uh, you know, being a black individual yourself, I just want to ask you, well, the first question I ask the guests at the moment is, so what does Black History Month mean for you? Um, that's a great question. Black History Month to me is a celebration at a whole. Um, it's important for myself, like you said, being a person of colour myself, to to educate and also acknowledge my roots and my culture and, and where I've come from, because there are so many things that we do on a daily basis and stuff that we take to, uh, for granted that we wouldn't be able to if, if it wasn't for these black creators and, and, and these fearless black people. But I also think it is important to to understand the monumental um, parts of history. But I also do think that it is very uh, important to understand that black hash- history is a lot more than just black suffering. And, you know, when we when we think of black history, we think of slavery, which is extremely important and, you know, should always be educated. You know, that should be celebrated. Like I said about all these inventions, I was, I, was, I think we did it um, for a lesson the other day at college. And I, and I found out that um, a, a black creator, Thomas Elkins, um, made the uh, the modern toilet, which is obviously something that we all spend time on. Um, yeah, yeah. He, he made the design with the porcelain more comfortable for us. And I think it's important for not just myself, but anybody to be in tune with that culture, because if we just if we if we don't, you know, educate ourselves in that, uh, generations and generations go by and, and you know it, it would just disappear um, and I also think that it's important to educate the ignorance to to uh, try and reduce the racism and segregation that still happens today black history is more than just stuff that happened way 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 in the past you know yeah yeah it's stuff that's still going on um, right now and I think the more people educate themselves the less will um, the less racism and suffering will have yeah, it's, that's a that's a really really good point around um, you know around the the bits that get forgotten in history, mm-hmm. and I think the other bits that get forgotten, and I use yourself as an example. You know, people might look at you when they when, when you step onto a football pitch as they should as a player, mm-hmm. and they'll go, oh yeah, well she played with the boys, played with the other. But actually, if you look at that on a deeper level in regards to that you're actually a girl playing within a boys team, mm-hmm. which naturally has its barriers. So. When we talk around, you know, in this instance, um, uh, black people that are, that have, you know, created history, it's not mm-hmm. necessarily only looking at whatever they've created, but looking at the kind of time frame and, and what the culture was like within that time. Definitely. And not only celebrating, like you said, the, their achievements, but celebrating the fact that the barriers that they've had to overcome within that. Exactly. And, you know, I, I think I mentioned it, I've mentioned it, you know, unapologetically too many times on this but I will continue mm. to keep doing so I think something that's really relevant for, for us as a current generation is you know we look at the the black footballers that we've currently got uh, at the top at the top level of the men's game it, in regards to Raheem Sterling uh, and um, Marcus Rashford mm-hmm. um, you know f- for me that, that that sums it up completely it's not it's not only footballers that have played to the top level but you know black footballers that have had to overcome yeah. a lot of hurdles to get to where they are but not only that but they're using their stage now to to now like you said try and change a gener you know influence and change a generation for the better mm-hmm. and it's around mm-hmm. celebrating that which I think is really powerful yeah I just want to I just want to delve a bit more into around what you're saying about educating yourself you know obviously you, you've obviously learned about you know some some uh black inventors um you know around their their creation so mm-hmm. What advice would you give to anyone listening or, or anyone that you'd speak to around, you know, how can they personally get involved within Black History Month? So what advice would you give them? Um, I would definitely, I know at the moment for, for like our gen, uh, my generation type, I know that Netflix at the moment have a really good range of uh, BLM collection movies and they're not all to do with, suffering some are just appreciating um black black male leads and black female leads and then you also have the educational stuff the things that are forgotten in history um so I know 
like my dad and I, we're watching a few. We're watching a a season called When They See Us, which is really interesting and also really educational on what's happening at the moment instead of you know what's happening many 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 years ago which which isn't which obviously is something that we need to to think about as well and also from my sister my sister uh, who's 20 at the moment she's uh, every time she's in the house there's always music blaring speakers blaring you know shells shaking and stuff like that she's always got some sort of some sort of afro beats or bashment or dance or on um and i think just just listening to things like that immersing yourself in the culture eating the foods like i'm getting my grandma to teach me how to season chicken things like <laughs> that making different things i just think that that is a really good way to not only educate yourself but just try and take little pieces away from the culture and and understand you know how great how great this is because i think that even though Black History Month is great, it should be every month. Do you know what I mean? It should yeah, be. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It be, uh, taught simultaneously with um, or adjacently with uh, its counterpart. When we learn about the Tudors and, and the Victorian times and stuff, we should also be 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 um, learning about the 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 Black culture of it. So yeah, just just little things like food and and music and little little daily things that you can just do. I think that will uh, help you get immersed in the culture and understand the world. Yeah, having that appreciation and, and not only appreciation of it, but, you know, delve a little bit deeper into it uh, around, you know, why is there certain things that mean certain things or uh, what's the significance of this? Uh, and I really like the, the point that you made around the music because I think that, you know, we can learn a lot from, you know, delving a little bit deeper into some of the music. Mm-hmm. Um which is fantastic. So the last little part that I want to talk about then, and, and I've got a feeling I might know who you might mention in this, but it's around a black role model. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this can be anyone you like, uh, you know, close as you want. Um, who is it for you? Um, I think at the, well, not at the moment. I think just in general, my my grandma plays a massive role in that. Um she was born in Jamaica um, and just, you know, you know, you know, grandmas, they all have, they have stories, they can talk for the world and things like that. But some of the, some of the things that, that, that she tells me about what, you know, what she had to sacrifice, things like that, what, what, and also what is so different from then to now, because obviously she's lived through the changing in society. So it's interesting to like get her opinion on, on you know what's happening now and, and what was happening before that um and also just seeing how or seeing and and being told and understanding how that they they lived in, in Jamaica um because you know you hear loads of stereotypes and things like that and because m- my dad is also a, a big role model to me in that situation as well from because he went to a a school in Watford that was predominantly white and when he used to go and visit his grandma in Jamaica, people would say like different stuff like, oh, do you actually live in a house and things like that? And mm. it's like, it is in a third world. Like it's, it's, it's not an alien planet. They, you know, yeah. they live yeah. ex- exactly the same, like um, places in uh, places, well, Africa as a whole is a massive place. And, you know, when you yeah. hear like, oh, it's all, it's all uh, poverty and things like that. It's really not. It's it's a it's a massive, massive, massive uh, continent, and mm. ju- just like England, there's places in England where there's poverty, and there's places in England where there's not. Um, and I just think it's important for people to understand that, you know, the stereotypes of <laughs> like walking barefoot and this and that. It, it, it's really, really not true in, in in regards to a place as a whole. Of course, there's going to be places where that is 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 true but like I said there's also places here where that's true and in America where that's true do yeah. you know what I mean yeah, so, 100%, yeah. yeah so I just think listening to what my dad has to say when he when he was in uh, a predominantly white school and listening to what my grandma was saying is she obviously comes because she came with a thick accent um so she would be stereotyped and things like that and it's just interesting to see how she coped with it that definitely because sometimes I'm like grandma if that was me I, I would honestly go mental at that person it's yeah. like, how do you keep your head and she and she always just says it, you just have to think of the bigger picture it, at that at that point it's not worth it you've got to pick your battles and then she always goes that's why I'm here t- today and things like that so yeah 
definitely my grandma and my granddad of course and then also my dad for a uh, just to understand the school the school type of it yeah and I think that's a really powerful um you know tool of education that is listening to you know not you know not only your grandparents but the older generation that, mm-hmm. that have obviously lived in a different different time time to us but and I've seen that change like you said it's really interesting um and I love that because, you know, that I really resemble with a lot of that, you know, speaking to my grandparents, speaking to some of the older relatives that I have within my family. And, mm-hmm. you know, uh, as much as I'm not oblivious to to the ter- terrible things that go on nowadays. Um, exactly. But it's so it's so interesting to to know how, you know, how it was for them and how they dealt with things um, uh, and how things were like, like, you know, in a different generation to, to what they are now. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's brilliant. Um, I just want to talk a little bit more around your dad then, because obviously I know you've mentioned your dad countless times. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, met, you know, you mentioned him on email, so I know that he's he's a big influence on you. Mm-hmm. Uh, talk to me a little bit around that then. Uh, me and my dad's uh, we're it's it's I don't want to say it in a in a you know in a stereotypical way, but it's very it's very you know my dad was the sports fan. My dad was. Um, you know was to do with football and he he he's the person one of the main reasons why I am so interested in in um sport because my mum was very much like oh do whatever you want you know if you're if yeah. you do whatever you want which I which I do um I am thankful for because it obviously let me like just do whatever I want um but my dad made sure that I was able to get to places like okay because when he was younger my my grandma was working quite a lot so he would have to get the bus effort that I never had to worry about where my lift would come from it would always be him if it's taking me to refereeing or taking me to football he would always do that he would always make sure that all my subs are paid and everything um so I do owe a lot of my success and a lot of the lessons that I've learned comes roots back right down to him um and he always gives me his honest opinion do you know you know if you've had a pretty stinky game and you get in the car and he always says oh T, what was all that about we always have a nice chat about it and he's always there if I if I'm going to the park to kick a football he always says oh do you want me to come and help you or I could be goalkeeper or something so yeah he's always there he's really invested and I couldn't really ask more in in that regard I love that. That's a that's a great story, um, and it's a lovely it's lovely to hear that. Um, and I think it's so important. We talked about the impact of on role models not only on younger people but but anyone really. And mm-hmm. you know, it's so lovely to 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 hear that. Um, mm-hmm. Let's talk around the future of football then. Um, first question for you then is obviously you know you're uh, uh, and this is no disrespect to you. Um, because you've obviously gone through a lot of stuff but this is more I would say more of credit to you because I I hope and I foresee a long future in the game for you thank you You know you're obviously you know where you are so I'm going to call this the start point Mm -hmm. Uh, let's imagine that you've got well not the start point you know you're into it now yeah let's imagine let's imagine let's say uh, I don't know 20 years down the line 10 years down the line you walk across you're walking through you know your local field where there's grassroots football being played mm-hmm. what do you hope to see um I definitely hope to see more female officials more female coaches especially especially in the the boys side of the game um I, I hope to see that there's more females involved with um whether it's coaching whether it's you know looking after kit wherever it's any anything I just hope to see more females in regards to that um I also hope to see lots of lots of people like lots of lots of uh little boys or little girls you know on the bench on the pitch whatever because sometimes you do when I am reffing a game it's like oh we're struggling to get these people or these people dropped out you know what I mean we're struggling to get the numbers or oh, we're only going to be able to pay with 10 today because you know we don't have enough players which which does make me sad because it's like oh it, you know football is such an enjoyable such a, such a lovely game so um it makes me sad that you're struggling to get you know numbers because then if that affects everybody else in the team as well so I hope to see lots lots of young people that are that are involved in the game um what else do I hope I hope to see 
Oh, I'm trying to think. I hope to see... Uh, I hope to see respect for for the referees, uh, definitely. I hope to see that because I think we are, like you said about the disease in the game, even though that's still very appar apparent, I think that we're slowly on the right track with, with things being in place, like you said with Jose, with, his, with, with the armband and what he's doing. I think it's we're on the right way to you know, respecting officials and respecting everybody in the game. So I hope to see that we're we've progressed from now um in those in those ten years time. Brilliant. I, I like the look of that. Um so we talk talking about a bit around the future of the game. Um and I think you know the the point that you mentioned around female having more female officials. Um mm -hmm. and I, I I firmly believe that that will start happening when we see you know, uh, more people like yourselves and, and more representation uh, from people, from females that are, that are choosing a pathway to go into refereeing. Mm -hmm. um, in regards to you then, so, you know, this is quite a unique question because you're obviously, you know, you're, you're, you're like I said, uh, uh, not the start, but not the end, you, mm -hmm. or not even the middle, really. You, you're like just, the, you know, just getting warmed up. I would say. Yeah. What, um, what does the future of football hold for you then? What, what do you hope to do? Um, I am, um, at the moment, we've obviously college we're pushing our UCAS out. So what I hope to be doing as a career would be around sports therapy or sports nutrition or something. That's what I've got my heart set on. Um, whether that's, whether in, like you said, in 10 years I'm with a specific club, hopefully that is football or just within sport generally, or if I'm just with an athlete, that's what I hope to do. Um, but apart from that, also, I hope to keep my refereeing going so that I have a, choices, do you, uh, do you know what I mean, with, um, yeah, yeah. with regards to what I want to do next. Um, and then with playing football myself, I, I tried to not put too much pressure on anything, on anything happening, you know, with being scouted, going to academies, going to first teams, this and that, because obviously the age I am, um, I try not to put too much pressure on it because then I feel like, football becomes a chore and obviously nobody likes doing chores so it just yeah. sucks women out of the game I think when like I said I think before um I play my best when I, when I'm enjoying it and I you know I officiate my best when I enjoy it so I try not to put too much stress on that however if something was to happen I'd obviously I, I, I would obviously jump at that opportunity um so I'm really just biding my time just just trying to see what's going on but also have a plan and a backup plan in my head as to what happens in the next couple of years but hopefully like you said I, I am just at the start hopefully I'm nowhere near yeah. My yeah no no and I think wow that, that that's a really impressive impressive answer because you know thinking about you know when I was when I was a little bit younger uh, and you know I remember having having um conversations with some of the, my mentors that I've got now and I you know, I was being asked the same question. I was going, yeah, well, I want to do this and I want to do this and I want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I did set myself up for a little bit of failure because when, when that didn't come true and then I, I kind of lost my head. But, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that you, you're you already at your age thinking, well, actually, you know, I like to do this and I like to do this uh, and I'm quite interested in this. So I'll take the steps, relevant steps. But, you know, just enjoying where you are and reflecting upon that. And I think that's such mm -hmm. a mature answer. Thank um, you. Yeah. Um, wow. And... To be honest with you, uh, I have no doubt that that you will have a have a long a long career in the game, uh, and I'm and I personally am very excited to see where you progress to. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so this is my last question then. I know it's a it might seem a little bit far off, but mm -hmm. it's a good one to start thinking about. Like we said before, you you know whilst you're kind of starting up, mm -hmm. what would you like your legacy to be within the game? Mm -hmm. My legacy. I like that. <laughs> um, I hope that I hope that I can see not not necessarily people following in my footsteps, but people relating to me or my story and thinking, uh, you know, I, I I would love to to. I, I'm a young girl, a person of color. I would love to be this. I'd love to be that. And I just hope that you know, if, if they were able to have a look and, and see my story, it would be like, it would push them to 
you know make, take the relevant steps to 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 become a, a referee or, or a player or or what, whatever I would I would have been doing by the end um and I also hope to just I guess inspire people inspire people help people um motivate themselves and you know like there's nothing special about me and, and I managed to do it do you know what I mean so you can do much more if you know what I mean 100% I love that I love that so yeah this idea around you know um you know using yourself as a role I, I, I know you, you're too humble to call yourself it so I'll call you <laughs> as a as a role model um yeah and inspiring inspiring the future generation yeah I think that's a great legacy to leave yeah. um Tia thank you ever so much for, for your time no think, worries thank you very much for having me it was a, it was it was very refreshing uh, I think just to have a little chat about it yeah no absolutely I think um yeah I'm I am so in, massively impressed by yourself um you know the uh, speaking to you for I think it's just just over an hour now but mm -hmm. you know speaking to you for just over an hour I can already see you know your passion and enthusiasm but not only that you, you've clearly got your head screwed on um so I'm, I'm very excited to see see where you go uh, and we'll definitely be uh be monitoring your your progress closely um so thank you for that um and just before we go there's a few announcements um just to make listeners aware so um the first one is uh, coach mental support is still available um if you would like to receive coach mental support particularly if you are um, a black or asian coach working within the game um, my details are up on the screen now so if you'd like to get involved then please do drop me an email um, and then secondly which is you know a bit more of a broader thing um, is to get involved within football you know as T has mentioned um, it all starts with getting involved in you know from someone that's just starting out to, to someone that might be a little bit further along the journey uh, whatever capacity that you want to join in in um, please just email us at support at bedfordshirefa.com which is on the screen now and and uh, get involved that's that's all we can really start is get started somewhere um and see where it can take you um but yeah thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next episode thank you